thanks to Curiosity Stream for keeping Legal Eagle in the air. By clicking the link in the description, you'll also get Nebula for free, a streaming platform made by and for creators like me. You know how normal people behave? Maybe you're one of them. You can hear a legal hypothetical and then you can disregard it for, say, the rest of your entire life. I'm not one of those people. If I hear a legal hypothetical, I'm going to run down every single permutation and every single applicable law I can think of until I have an answer. It's sort of like how Lewis Black, when he overheard, if I weren't for my horse, I never would have gotten through college. And then that's all he could think of for the entire rest of his day. Something like that happened to me recently when I came upon a Reddit post that asked the question, can I sue my beekeeper neighbor? Apparently the beekeeper's bees were stealing the neighbor's pollen and turning it into honey. The question was also shared on the popular social media hive known as Twitter. And if you don't think that this video is going to be filled with all kinds of bee puns, you are sadly mistaken, my friend. I've covered bee law before, and I'm not afraid to go back again. Objection. Ah, the non-lawyer makes an objection. Now, of course, the beekeeper neighbor sounds like the setup for a horror movie about a man who roams the neighborhood in a beekeeper outfit, terrorizing children on Halloween with one of those little smoke canister things. I'm not exactly sure how he would kill people, but you know, that's for the movie execs to figure out. And I know that this would be a straight to streaming knockoff of Friday the 13th, but this Redditor's problem is more basic than a serial killing beekeeper. He writes, every day I see my neighbor's bees flying around my garden, stealing the pollen or nectar from my flowers. Then the bees go back to my neighbor and creates honey. My neighbor then harvests the honey and sells it at the farmer's market for a profit. I have never received so much as a jar of honey as compensation and every day my neighbor's bees trespass and steal my flowers. I was stung once when I was a child so I know how dangerous bees can be. The way I see it, this is equivalent to a person's dog coming into my yard to steal balls or tools. You know, as dogs do. Then gives it back to his owner who then <laughs> sells it for a profit. Do I have legal grounds to sue? What type of things should I begin documenting in order to prepare for a legal battle? What would be a fair settlement amount if my neighbor doesn't want to take this to court? Thanks for the help. This is so ridiculous. So does this Redditor have the right to sue the neighbor and his pesky bees for the return of his extremely, in quotes, valuable pollen? Let's find out. Now, as you may know, there are 20,000 species of bees in the world. You may want to tell bees to just buzz off, but wild bees play a serious role in making sure humans get to eat. Bees pollinate plants that are not capable of reproducing without the aid of bees. The plants grow up to produce fruit and vegetables that we eat. The Western honeybee is the biggest pollinator in the world. Many people domesticate and breed honeybees for exactly this purpose. It's a whole cottage industry. Beekeepers are sort of the hired guns of the agricultural world. They are hired and they bring a truckload of bees to help pollinate certain orchards. In fact, the demand for almond milk has led to an increased demand for bees. Now, American beekeepers have had great financial success renting out their hive to commercial almond producers. However, success comes at a steep cost. 50 billion bees were annihilated in just a few months during the winter of 2018 and 2019. The culprit, as you may know, stems from the herbicides and pesticides that are used, as well as the intense environment for producing almonds. The bees are forced to work in a monoculture rather than a biodiverse environment where bees naturally thrive. The worker bees are stressed out, used up, and ultimately die in what one scientist called war-like circumstances. He said, it's like sending the bees to war, many don't come back. Now, I know, I know, you didn't come here to listen to a monologue about the plight of bees who work in sweatshops. You wanna know about bee law. Now, there is such a thing as bee law? Well, not exactly, but there is a body of law that deals with injury or damage caused by wild and domesticated animals. If you were wondering when lawyers actually deal with the law of wild animals, you might actually be surprised to know that that's in the first year of law school. There are large sections of both property and tort law that deal specifically with wild animals, even though few lawyers, if any, actually deal with wild animals on a regular basis. So let's break down this Redditor's question. First of all, he's claiming to be very angry that bees steal pollen from his flowers, which the bees then use to create nectar. In his view, his neighbor is therefore unreasonably enriched by beekeeping. He's saying all this despite the real role that bees play in keeping us fed and happy. 
What a buzzkill. Anyway, under the law, his chances of successfully suing for damages over the neighbor's bees are slim to none. If there is a local law that makes keeping bees on the property illegal, then the owner of the bees might be liable for certain acts or omissions or a regular nuisance. If bees attacked the neighbor and the neighbor wasn't allowed to have bees on the property to begin with, then that might be negligence per se, but obviously that isn't the situation here. Realistically, the man can argue three legal theories for a lawsuit. Conversion, negligence, and strict liability. So let's start with conversion. The person wants to sue for theft. That is known in civil courts as conversion. Conversion is when someone does the following without your consent. They take property and don't return it. They sell your property. They make substantial changes to the property, such as cutting down trees. And I'm definitely going to get to the cutting down trees hypotheticals on Reddit in just a little while, because you guys are crazy for tree law. Uh, or they damage or misuse your property without consent. The elements of conversion, the things the plaintiff must prove to win their case, is that the person has a legal right to the property, that means that they own it, the defendant intentionally interfered with possession of the property, and the defendant's actions caused the plaintiff to lose the property. To prove conversion under these facts, the guy who's so buzzed off about the bees would have a tough time. First, he'd need to show that he had a legal right to the property. Let's assume that he owns the flowers. But at step two, he may have a problem. He needs to show that the neighbor purposefully interfered with his possession of the flowers. We can't know the intent of the bees unless, of course, they are voiced by Jerry Seinfeld. You like jazz? And if we know anything about bees, we know that they don't like to take direction. You know, I don't think these are flowers. Should we tell him? I think he knows. I don't know what prompted them to make this movie, but it didn't exactly have a lot of buzz for a sequel, sadly. In our conflict, the intent that matters is that of the neighbor. Did he own the bees in question? Can the man prove it? If so, can we infer that the beekeeper wanted the bees to fly next door to pilfer the pollen? And by now, you see the difficulties with this argument. And the other element is proving damages. Did the bees cause damage or injury or, or loss to the plaintiff? Although the man does a decent job of making the case, he said that the neighbor eventually makes money by selling the honey, that's also a difficult argument. No harm was done to the flowers. In fact, you could argue that the plants were enhanced by the bees' attention. People pay good money for having bees come to their property to pollinate the different flowers there. And what about his hypothetical? The way I see it, this is equivalent to a person's dog coming to my yard to steal balls or tools. It gives it back to the owner and who then sells it for profit. And he has a point. Under the law, if a person can prove that the neighbor sent the dog into the yard for the purpose of stealing the tools, he could have a claim for conversion. In fact, in many states, there are already laws that prohibit a predator dog from trespassing and hurting or killing livestock on that yard. And there's even a common law rule that allows people to kill dogs if necessary to protect property. You see an example of this in the famous scene in To Kill a Mockingbird. But is this situation with the bees directly analogous? Not really. The man has a lot to prove. The ownership of the bees, the intent on the part of the neighbor, theft of something in the natural world like pollen and actual damages. Almost all of those are going to be a huge problem in a claim for conversion. So let's talk about the second cause of action, negligence. The legal definition of negligence is a failure to behave with a level of care that someone of ordinary prudence would have exercised under the circumstances where someone has a duty to act that way. A person of ordinary prudence is legally for a person who behaves appropriately. This is called the reasonable person standard. And as you can guess, it's not always easy to determine whether a person is acting like a reasonable average human being. Negligent conduct may consist of an act or a failure to act when there is a duty to do so. If the person doesn't have a legal duty to act, then they can't be negligent. And in general, people don't have a duty to act for the benefit of others unless the circumstances are such that they give rise to a duty. When might you have a duty to act appropriately? Well, driving, for example. If you run a red light and strike another car, a court could find you liable for negligence. This is because you had a responsibility to act in a way that poses no danger to other motorists. When do you not have a duty to act? Well, a rescue, for example. Generally, you don't have a legal duty to rescue someone, even if you're walking on the beach and you see a stranger drowning. There's just no general duty to risk your own life to save the life of someone else's. So let's talk about the legal elements to a negligence claim. Keep in mind that the law varies from state to state, but most jurisdictions require a person to prove four things to show negligence. Number one, the existence of a legal duty that the defendant owed to the plaintiff. Two, the defendant's breach of that duty. 
three, plaintiff's sufferance of an injury, and four, proof that the defendant's breach caused the injury. If an animal owner has acted reasonably to prevent someone else from being injured, the plaintiff probably won't be able to recover damages. Now, is there some negligence claim to be had here? Well, maybe, but probably not. He would have a much stronger case if the bee stung him or caused some damage to his property. There aren't many published negligence cases involving bees or even bee stings. It's usually people aren't stung unless the bees are provoked and bees exist in the wild. But one exception was a Miami Beach apartment building that had a massive beehive inside the walls. When the property manager went to check out the apartments, she got stung and went to the ER. When maintenance workers found the hive, Honey had started to drip down the walls and through the ceiling. Before the building owners cleaned it up, a tenant slipped on the honey and fell down the stairs. This chain of events left the apartment building owners with several different lawsuits. The cases eventually settled for a combined $1.4 million. But what's important here is that the Miami Beach apartment building knew they had a dangerous situation on their hands. The beehive had been discovered, the building manager wound up in the ER, and honey was literally dripping all over the floor. Here, the building owners had a duty to act. A building owner must act as a reasonable landlord towards the tenants. But here, they didn't do anything about the problem. The tenant who slipped in the honey has a typical slip and fall negligence case. But once again, the poster's question doesn't quite measure up. Nobody had a clear duty to stop the bees from flying in the air to a different property. And the man can't show that the neighbor breached a duty unless there are other circumstances like a law outlawing beekeepers in the, in the neighborhood. And the man would have trouble showing an injury. His plants weren't really harmed. If anything, he got a benefit. And since there's no injury, there's likely no monetary damages either. So let's talk about the third and final cause of action. There's one more theory to pursue. That's called strict liability. Strict liability is automatic liability. That means that the defendant is liable regardless of the defendant's intent or what they knew or should have known at the time. If something happened and that gives rise to strict liability, you're strictly liable. If strict liability applies, the defendant must pay if his or her conduct caused the plaintiff's injuries. So for example, in a products liability case, a company who manages a defective product that injures someone will be liable for the plaintiff's injuries, regardless of whether the company knew there was some serious or dangerous defect because product liability is strict liability. So for example, in 2016, Samsung's Galaxy 7 cell phone had a battery flaw that caused them to spontaneously explode. Class action lawsuits have been filed on the strict liability theory because the cell phone is a product. Strict liability also applies if someone creates an abnormally dangerous condition or performs ultra hazardous activities, causing injury to another person. So if you are driving a semi truck full of fireworks, maintaining a nuclear power plant or storing dynamite, these are the kind of ultra hazardous activities that you'll be strictly liable if someone is injured, regardless of whether you were negligent and regardless of whether you knew that there was a problem or not. Some jurisdictions impose strict liability if a pet attacks or bites someone. So if you have a pet circus tiger who mauls your neighbor, you might get in trouble. Be sure to check your local laws before becoming the next Siegfried and Roy. Ah! States which impose strict liability for injuries caused by animals often make a distinction between domesticated animals and wild animals. Remember I talked about what you learn in law school? Well, for some reason, we spend a huge amount of time on the law of wild animals. A wild animal is normally considered to be one that is, quote, not by custom devoted to the services of mankind in the time and place that it is kept. People who own wild animals are subject to strict liability for injury caused to persons or property by animals in their possession. In contrast, owners of domesticated animals are generally only liable if they are negligent. Whether an animal is wild or domesticated varies from state to state. Take the case of an aggressive duck. That's it. No more Mr. Nice Duck. No, no, not that one. Uh, this one. A woman sued a neighbor in Oregon after she was ambushed by an aggressive duck. The sketchy duck, whose name is Lolita Rose, allegedly had attacked people before. The woman fell and broke her wrist and injured her shoulder. Oregon law applies the strict liability rule for injuries caused by domestic animals. However, under Oregon law, the owner has to be aware that the animal has a propensity for danger. In practice, this means that most animals get one free nip or bite or attack. 
This is actually a common law and you hear often about the one free bite rule. How else would a person know that their pet duck or cat or bat has a propensity for danger? Well, legally the plaintiff has to show that the animal has injured someone in the past. To prove a theory of negligence, the plaintiff must show that the owner was negligent or had knowledge that the duck was quite dangerous and that the duck had caused the woman's injuries. Now, in the case of the duck Lolita Rose, the plaintiff said that the duck's owner failed to properly maintain control of her domesticated animal, failed to warn neighbors about the dangerous duck in their midst, and failed to keep the duck contained on her property. She alleged both strict liability and negligence as theories of liability. Now, returning to our B dilemma, the first question we have to answer is whether the bees are wild or domesticated. The law may differ on this from state to state, but for the sake of argument, let's say that the bees are domesticated since they are raised by the neighbor for commercial purposes. If this happened in Oregon, there could be liability on the basis that the neighbor knew the bees were unbelievably mean and dangerous. But this theory of liability breaks down uh, because the bees didn't do anything dangerous or hazardous or even mean for that matter. They didn't swarm the man or attack his children or kill his dog. They just simply bugged him. Now, all the bees did is exactly what bees are meant to do. Romance the flowers. And we talked about this briefly, but maybe it's actually a boon to the neighbor to have his flowers pollinated. If that's the case, it might actually be that the neighbor who claims that the pollen was stolen actually owes money to the neighbor. Under a theory of quantum merit or promissory estoppel, if this gave rise to a contract, if he knew he was getting a benefit and knew that the neighbor would have charged him for that service, maybe he's the one that owes money to his neighbor. So my advice to the original Redditor is pretty simple. Just ask your neighbor for a jar of honey and let it be. Now, if you're the type of person that loves getting dubious legal advice from Reddit, you'll love the Nebula and Curiosity Stream bundle. Because Nebula is where I put my extended and unrated videos as well as my bloopers. For example, you might have noticed a new series on this channel called The Case Of. It's an animated recreation of real true crime cases in some of the most famous legal trials in history like the case of the shotgun booby trap and the case of the genius murderers Leopold and Loeb. You can see some of those on YouTube, but Nebula lets me put up my uncut versions that I actually can't show on YouTube. It's still legal legal, but now with 10% more murder. And in fact, I'm putting up a version of this episode up on Nebula that doesn't have ads and it has all of the bloopers from this video. Because it can be hard on YouTube when you're dealing with sensitive subjects, because the only thing scarier than murder is getting demonetized which is why my creator friends and I teamed up to build our own platform where creators don't need to worry about demonetization and the dreaded algorithm. It's called Nebula, and we're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream. Nebula is a place where creators can do what we do best, create. It's a place where we can both house our content ad-free and also experiment with new original series that probably wouldn't work on YouTube. And when I say that Nebula is built by creators for creators, I really mean it. Nebula features lots of YouTube's top educational-ish creators like Thomas Frank, Knowing Better, H Bomber Guy, and Tirzu, as well as tons of others. We get to collaborate in ways that wouldn't work on YouTube, and we get to work together on Nebula exclusive videos that will never be on YouTube. The project is self-funded, not backed by investors, and we've managed to make this ad-free with no dreaded algorithm. So what does this have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, as the internet's go-to place for documentaries and long-form educational content, they love educational creators. So they were the perfect partner for Nebula. And in fact, we just worked out a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream with a link in the description, not only will you get one free month of CuriosityStream, but you'll also get a Nebula subscription for free. And to be clear, that Nebula subscription is not a trial. It's free for as long as you're a CuriosityStream member, which means that if you sign up for CuriosityStream, which is less than $20 a year, not only do you get unlimited access to CuriosityStream's massive library of gorgeous high-budget documentaries, but you'll also get to enjoy the private playground of YouTube's best educational creators for no additional charge. In fact, one of my favorite CuriosityStream documentaries is Peter Sagal's History, which explains how some of the pivotal events in US history are tied to money, including Watergate and the Civil War. They even have documentaries documentaries about the secret lives of bees. So just click on the link in the description to get the CuriosityStream Nebula bundle. You get both CuriosityStream and Nebula and you'll be supporting creators
creators like me directly. Or you can go to curiositystream.com slash legal eagle. But seriously, just click on the link in the description. You won't be disappointed. So do you agree with my legal analysis about bee paralysis? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this playlist over here with all of my other reactions to Reddit and your favorite movies and me explaining how everything is just illegal. So click on this playlist and I'll see you in court.